forward. So our topic uh, tonight, or today for some of you, is from enemy to ally, how a religious Jew learned to value interfaith dialogue and relationships. And we have as our guest, my very good friend, colleague and teacher, Rabbi Eugene Korn, Rabbi Dr. Eugene Korn. Uh, I'll read to you part of Eugene's biography. Eugene Hurd holds a PhD in moral philosophy from the Columbia University and is also an ordained Orthodox rabbi. He previously was the academic director of the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding in Israel and executive director of Sacred Heart University's Institute for Christian Jewish Understanding. And also he's the national director of Interfaith Affairs at the Inter Anti-Defamation League in New York. He's the author or the editor of seven books on Jewish ethics and theology and on Jewish Christian relations. Eugene lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Lilia, Lila, and I especially wanna emphasize he's a member of the Roots Jewish Christian Religious Leaders Dialogue Group from its very inception, I think was five years ago. Uh, and I count Eugene as a close friend and as a teacher. I learn a lot from him. So I'm gonna pass the uh, microphone on to Eugene, please. Uh, thank you, Hanan. Um, good evening or uh, good afternoon. Um, it's really, for me, personally, a blessing to be here uh, to speak to you and to uh, work again with my really good friend, my Yadid Nefesh, Kanan Schlesinger, and to help out Roots. Kanan and I um, have been involved in a number of uh, different projects over the, year, over the years uh, here in Israel. Um, and uh, what Kanan is doing with, uh, in his Roots organization, his project, um, is is unique and it requires an enormous amount of courage um, to try to break through um, the impasse, uh, both in terms of understanding, you know, and in terms of uh, identification and empathy between uh, Israelis and uh, Arabs or Palestinians uh, in this part of the world. Uh, so again, it's really an honor for me to be here and to talk to you tonight. I assume most of you are in America, except for uh, Asways. Is that correct? Can you can make that assumption? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me start out by saying that uh, on, October, on October 25th, 1965, the earth moved, to use Ernest Hemingway's famous phrase. Uh, on October 5th, 25th, 1965, a revolution took place. Um, it's, it wasn't a revolution with bombs or guns or bullets, but it was a revolution in religious thinking and theology and relationships. And you may have missed the revolution. Uh, I did when, uh, in 1965. I was not cognizant of things taking place on, in another part of the world. Um, but those uh, that revolution, which I'll discuss in more detail in a little while, um, now affects all of the Jewish people. Um, no matter how much you want to think you're severed from the world, um, this revolution has had universal impact uh, on us as a people. And let me give you a little bit about my bio, um, so you get a sense of uh, my background and my sensibilities. Um, I grew up in a no-name suburb of Newark, New Jersey, called Irvington, New Jersey. This is Philip Roth territory, for those of you who uh, read Philip Roth. Um, I was kind of an all-American boy. I was the president of the National Honor Society in Irvington High School, public school. I was a leading member of the basketball team. Um, I was cut out to, to be an All-American boy to go to an Ivy League university. Um, but uh, I experienced a crisis in my, in my junior and senior year. Um, my parents were not particularly uh, Jewishly religious, but we were very highly identified culturally and ethnically as Jews. And uh, in the 60s, uh, which is when I was in high school, the world was just opening up. It was the era of civil rights. Um, it was the era of the Peace Corps. 
Um, it was the era of a certain of, of hippies, and uh, it was an era of a great optimism amongst the youth. Um, and it seemed like uh, the world was my oyster. There were no growing up then. We thought there were absolutely no limits on what we could achieve to improve the world. Um, and yet, I had this Jewish ethnic particularist identity. And I felt there was a great contradiction between my sense of uh, Jewish ethnicity and this kind of universal human vision. Um, and then I also realized that I didn't know very much about Judaism. You know, I knew about gefilte fish and, uh, and fasting on Yom Kippur, but beyond that, it really wasn't uh, very much. So um, instead of going to an Ivy League school, I went to Yeshiva University to really learn about what Judaism was. And there, um, Yeshiva University uh, gave me a very fine Jewish education, but it was like going back in time, in a sense. Um, it was a kind of uh, self-enclosed, uh, hermetically sealed Jewish environment. And the world was a kind of, was, was almost background noise. Um, and certainly uh, we didn't, we didn't have any direct contact with uh, Gentiles. We didn't even have direct contact with women. I mean, it was just like a Jewish monastery at Yeshiva College. Uh, but I learned to live, uh, I learned a lot about Judaism. Now, and I also learned about um, certain stereotypes and prejudices about Christians. Now, most of the things I'm going to talk about tonight have to do with the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, or, Judea, or Jews and Christians, but um, I believe it has tremendous universal implications for relationships between Jews and Muslims, Jews and Hindus, um, Jews and, and all other faiths. Um, so what did we learn in a traditional Jewish um, school about Christians? Uh, well, Probably, you know, the most uh, searing teaching, you know, comes from the Bible. And uh, in the Bible, uh, there's a lot of dysfunction in the Jewish family. Let me put it that way, in, in the book of Genesis. Um, and uh, one of the primary dysfunctions is the rivalry between two brothers, Esau and Jacob. And if you know the biblical story... Um, Jacob steals the blessing. Uh, Esau is the elder, and he has the rights to the uh, to the uh, blessing of uh, of the elder. And Jacob steals the blessing by uh, through a ruse. And when Esau finds out about it, he really wants to kill his brother. So Jacob flees, and he spends twenty years um, with Lavan, his uh, uncle. And uh, he comes back after 20 years for this great confrontation to meet his brother who wanted to kill him 20 years ago. And uh, Jacob doesn't know whether the brother still hates him. Jacob doesn't know whether, whether Esau is going to forgive him. So the Bible tells us this very poignant scene where they meet. And um, the Bible says that Esau falls on Jacob's neck uh, and he kissed Jacob, and they wept. Okay, so supposedly that's a very heartwarming uh, uh, event of reconciliation and uh, sibling love. Um, but that's not, not the way the rabbis interpreted it. And if you learn in traditional Jewish schools, um, there are dots over the word, uh, and he kissed him, Yishakehu. And the rabbis say, ah, the dots tell you that the kiss wasn't sincere that the truth is that Esau still hated Jacob. He went through the motions of kissing him, uh, but he still hated him. And by the way, he will always hate him. He will always hate him. Now, this statement was made in the time of the, the Talmudic era, and Esau became uh, a symbol for the Roman Empire. So what the rabbi meant when he said that uh, Esau will always hate Jacob, it was code language for Rome, or the Roman Romans will always hate Jews. 
That's what it meant in the Talmudic period. Um, but in the, um, in the third century, fourth century, uh, something great, a great change happened in the Roman Empire and Christianity became the imperial religion. So, and, and then, and there was also a great deal of hostility between the new Christian church and the Jewish people. So it was very easy to take this image of Esau always hating Jacob. And instead of Esau becoming, a, uh, being a symbol for Rome, it now became the symbol for Christianity and Christians. And again, that was very easy to do because, you know, what color is uh, Esau identified with? The Bible says that he was born, he was very ruddy, had a ruddy complexion, he was red. And what was the imperial color of the Roman Empire? Red. And what is the color of the church? Red. So this um, piece of Talmudic lore uh, became very, very famous in the consciousness of religious Jews that Esau hates Jacob. And not only did he hate him at the time of the Bible or at the time of the Talmud or at the time of uh, in the fourth century, but it was almost like an eternal law of nature that Esau will always hate Jacob. And that was code language for the thesis that Christianity will always be the enemy of the Jewish people and Christians will always hate Jews. Now, I don't know if this sounds strange to you. I mean, uh, growing up in pluralistic America, I never thought that way. I, I grew up in an ethnic town with a lot of um, immigrant, children of immigrants. There were, there were Irish Catholic, there were Polish Catholic, Italian Catholics, uh, Protestants, and um, I never thought that they hated me because I was Jewish. I didn't think that way, but that was, that was the traditional mindset, but that is still today the traditional mindset in many, many religious Jews and traditionalist Jews, and even some uh, liberal Jews. I'll tell you a story about something that happened to me at the 92nd Street Y in, in a little while. Now, the truth is that the church, the Christianity, was the mortal enemy of Judaism for about 1,500 years. Um, and uh, again, something we might not perceive too uh, clearly in pluralistic America, in democratic, almost secular America, but throughout Jewish history, from the fourth century until the 20th century, the church had very hostile, and sometimes hateful teachings about Judaism. Um, uh, this essentially the teaching was that Judaism had a, a, the Jewish people had a covenant with God up until the time of Jesus, and at the time of Jesus, the church replaced Israel as the people of God, as the the um, the chosen people, and uh, Judaism no longer had any function in the world because Christianity superseded or replaced Judaism in the eyes of God and in God's love. And Jews became not only irrelevant, but they became um, targets of great hostility and even hatred because the church now had triumphed and Judaism uh, had been defeated. Now, let me see if I can show you a picture of this um, because pictures are, are very uh, compelling. Um, hang on, let's see if I can share screen. Um, is the is the are we sharing the screen now? Not, Not yet. yet. Okay, so we have to go to a share screen mode. Um, Can you help me here, uh, Hanan? How do we get to the shared screen? Oh, okay, here we go. Okay, um, here we go. Just a moment. Okay, so how many of you have been to, uh, to Europe, to Strasbourg, France? 
Yeah, in the main cathedral in Strasbourg, France, uh, there's two statues outside, very prominently displayed. And uh, this is a common motif in uh, church architecture and in uh, church teachings. And the name of this, uh, these statues are Ecclesia and Synagogue, church, the church, and the synagogue. Christianity and Judaism. So on the left, everybody can see this, uh, these two icons here. Yes, on the left, you have the church, and on the right, you have the synagogue or Judaism. Now, what you notice on the left is that the, the woman is standing erect. And she has a very straight staff, which indicates uh, victory and power. Um, and uh, if you look at synagogue on the right, um, I don't know if you can see, but she's blindfolded. Uh, she's blind to the truth. She's looking downward. She's defeated. Her staff is uh, broken. And she's holding uh, a book of the Torah down to the ground as if it's, a, it's, um, it's obsolete. So the picture really was that Christianity had triumphed, Judaism was defeated, um, and that the Christians were superior to the Jews. And therefore, the Christians had a right to humiliate the Jews for their religious blindness, for their religious blindness. Now, this is a, this is a picture that portrays a relationship, be, not between Christians and Jews, but between Christianity and Judaism. Uh, I don't know if this sounds new to many of you, but this was the normative dominant teaching of the church for 1500 years. Now, there's another, there's another portrait of uh, Ecclesia and Synagogue outside the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris in Paris. And this is a little more sinister and there's a, something happens here. Um, this is the close up of Synagogue. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, over the head of Synagogue, you have snakes curling around the head of Synagogue. So this is now moves from a picture of Judaism to a picture of Jews. Jews are now evil because snakes are the symbol of evil and sinfulness. Okay. So now we have moved from anti-Judaism to anti-Semitism. The difference is anti-Judaism is the disparagement of Judaism as a faith. Anti-Semitism is a prejudice or a disparagement against Jews, against Jews. And that's that. The, the anti-Judaism in Christian teachings morphed into anti-Semitism about Jews, per se. And uh, this was, again, a very common dominant thesis. And if you think it was only the Catholic Church, you know, that believed this or taught this about Jews, uh, let me show you another common motif in medieval architecture. Um, this is called the Judensau. This is a, a, a bas relief um, that exists in a church in Wittenberg, Germany, a Protestant, a Protestant church in Wittenberg, Germany. And what you see here, you have a swine, you have a pig. And uh, can you, anybody read the, uh, what it says up on the top there? Can anybody read that? It says Rabbini, rabbis. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a picture of rabbis, and you know the rabbis because if you look beneath the swine, you have a couple of smaller figures, and they're wearing funny hats. This is these are Jew hats, right? So you have two rabbis who are suckling uh, the milk of a pig, of a swine, and on the left you have a rabbi who's lifting up the tail of the pig and is sniffing the anus of the pig. This was the portrait of Jews in traditional, uh, traditional Christianity in 1500 years in Europe. And it just so happens this is the church where Martin Luther prayed. So this was the dominant picture of Jews throughout, uh, throughout 1500 years. This is, it was an ugly set of teachings. Uh, the official name is supersessionism, that Christianity superseded Jew, uh, Judaism. Um, and it was also called the teachings of contempt because the, the church taught 
both the Catholic and the Protestant church thought that Judaism was contemptible and Jews were contemptible. So this old teaching about Esau always hating Jacob or Christians always hating Jews had a lot of um, historical basis to it. Um, now, this is really kind of my frame, what I was taught when I was in the Jewish school at Yeshiva University, and sometimes explicitly, but mostly it was implicit that, that Christians were A, inferior to Jews, and B, they hated Jews. And Jews were surrounded by hating Christians, or at least hating Christians in theory, right? We never had the power to, to do violence against Christians the way Christians had done violence against Jews with pogroms and, and um, attacks, especially during Holy Week. Um, but we hated them in our minds, you know, and we fought them in our minds and then in our midrashim. Um, all of this uh, uh, was, uh, it was somewhat strange to me because I had lived with Christians in high school with Italian Catholics and Polish Catholics and German Protestants, and, and I didn't encounter any of this. So there was like a certain cognitive dis dissonance. There was a, a disparity between what I experienced in high school living with Christians and what I was being taught uh, by the rabbis uh, in, uh, in the Jewish school. Now, all of this changed for me personally um, in uh, 1994, right, when I found myself in Jerusalem at the Shalom Hartman Institute. I'm sure many of you heard about the Shalom Hartman Institute. I was a fellow there. And uh, they threw me into a seminar on uh, modern or contemporary theology. Right? And in this seminar, I met absolutely stunning, impressive people. They were, many of them were Christian theologians who had chosen to live in Jerusalem because they felt living with the Jewish people was the best way they could live out their Christian life. And they were very sophisticated, very knowledgeable, and very, um, what can I say, morally sensitive people. So this was the exact opposite of what I had been taught about Christians always hating Jews. Um, and uh, I began to realize that uh, I really needed to understand Christianity better because here were these wonderful models, these wonderful human beings who wanted to be with the Jewish people, who loved the Jewish people, um, and it clashed very, very deeply with uh, what I had been taught in, in yeshiva. Um, a couple other things happened providentially. Excuse me, Eugene, can you uh, stop sharing the screen? Yes, okay. Two other things that happened. I read a magnificent essay by Abraham Joshua Heschel. Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote an essay um, in the late 60s. I read it in the 90s. Um, it's called No Religion is an Island. It's a variation of John Donne's famous um, statement. Um, no, no person is an island. Okay. Oh, man. And, um, and Heschel meant to say that no religion, you know, can survive successfully by being an island unto itself. We have to connect with other religions. Um, and another thing that happened was uh, just, you could say coincidentally or providentially, there happened to have been um, an Orthodox rabbi in the seminar from New Jersey who um, was the head of the, the Department of Jewish Christian Studies at Seton Hall University. Most people know about Seton Hall University because it has a nationally ranked basketball team. But this was an Orthodox rabbi who was teaching at, in this Department of Jewish Christian Studies. And he said, would you want to come back and teach Judaism at a Catholic university? And I have, was going back the following year. So I found myself at this Catholic university. So all these things came together at the same time. And I was very struck. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, the, the contemporary teachings of the church, not the teachings of the church uh, up until the 1960s or up until this revolution that occurred in 1965. But what Catholics and, and Protestant Christians really, believe, many Protestant churches believe today about Jews and Judaism. So now let me just tell you what the, what the revolution was. In 1965, in uh, October 1965, 
Um, the Second Vatican Council, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council took place between 1962 and 1965. It was the largest assembly of, uh, of Catholic uh, clerics in 200 years. And they recognized that something was deeply wrong with how they understood Jews and Judaism. Um, and they sat and um, understood that they had to change their teachings about Jews and Judaism. Now, what, what really caused this? Um, let me just show you one more screen here. What, what caused this? It's known as the, Comp the Copernic Copernican Revolution uh, in Catholic theology. Um, what changed, but first the Christian world to reinvestigate and to transform its teachings about Judaism was the Shoah. The Shoah happened in the middle of Christian Europe. And the question came up, how could it happen that Christians could willingly either or actively uh, promote the extermination of Jews in the most horrible way. And if they weren't active, they were at least passed, they passively accepted the final solution. Okay. Um, Nazis were not believing Christians, but most of the people who ran the crematoria in Auschwitz were believing Christians. So the Christian world realized that something had gone terribly wrong within Christianity. And um, they investigated it and they realized that it had to do with that this was the result of their teaching of contempt about Jews and Judaism. And they came out with a magnificent theological statement uh, in October 1965 called Nostra Aetate, uh, our, in our time, um, where that reversed all of the teachings about Judaism um, that the church had taught for um, 1500 years. 1600 years, perhaps. And it taught, first of all, that anti Semitism was a sin against God. It taught that Jesus and Christianity has its roots in Judaism and the Jewish people. It taught that Jews are not responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, and it also taught that it needs that Christianity to understand itself needs to learn about Judaism and, and have dialogue with Jews. So, uh, because to understand the roots of Christianity, you need to understand Judaism. And that created a whole new world, a whole new world of dialogue and interaction and mutual understanding between uh, Jews and Christians. Um, and then, and, and that's really, the revolution that started in the 60s and continues up until today. That's matured. It took a lot of time. I was part of that. I was blessed to be part of that. Um, it took time. Um, we had to build. Jews were very, very suspicious of the church early on. Uh, these people wanted to kill us for 1,600 years, and now they want to make love to us. I mean, what's going on here? There must be some ulterior motive. So it took a lot of time to build trust between Jews and Christians. And there was a lot of resistance, a tremendous amount of resistance amongst traditional Jews, you know, toward engaging on a serious level with Christians. The attitude has been and still is in many quarters, you know, let them live, you know, let, may God, as, as Tevye said in, in uh, Fiddler on the Roof, you know, may God bless and keep the czar far away from us. Um, so that was the attitude of many religious Jews about Christians. It's good they're not killing us anymore, but we don't want to have anything to do with them. I'll tell you that in Israel, there was a poll about 10 years ago by a secular institution, the Van Leer Institute here in Jerusalem. Hanan knows of the Van Leer Institute. And they took polls on attitudes toward Christians in the state of Israel. Um, today, there are about um, 80,000 Christians in the state of Israel. And uh, the poll came back that most secular Jews in Tel Aviv couldn't care less. Christians are allowed to, you know, it's okay for Christians to be here um, as long as they're good citizens. And the poll amongst religious Jews was uh, enormous hostility toward Christians. They didn't want them in Israel. They don't trust them. 
um, and, and they would rather get rid of them than have them here. So there is still this traditional resistance against Christianity, and most Jews are clueless, are absolutely clueless about this dramatic Copernican revolution that's taking place within uh, Christianity. Um, and it's particularly true amongst the Orthodox Jews uh, today, although even that's breaking down uh, to some level. Um, now, just let me try to outline for you really briefly, because I want to hear from you, um, the, uh, how the Christian world is, is structured. Many Jews think Christians are Christians are Christians. Right? It? There may be individual differences between Christian individuals, but Christianity is Christianity is Christianity. That ain't true. Right? Um, the Christian world largely breaks into three different groupings. Um, on the, you could say, the theological and political right, you have evangelical Christians. Now, evangelical Christians tend to be more literalist. Uh, they, there's a whole, they're nuanced, and there's a gamut of even evangelical Christians, but Jews are kind of schizophrenic about Christians because they're the greatest political supporters of Israel. They, they provide enormous political support in Washington for Israel, they, and they give significant amount of money to Israel. But theologically, many of them are still supersessionists. That is, many of them still would like Jews to convert to Christianity. Uh, that's the, the even and Jews don't know how to relate to that. I mean, on the one hand, they're our political friends, but they they still want to make Christians of us. So, what do we do with this? Um, in the center, you have the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is very traditionalist, and uh, except on this issue of the relationship of. Christianity to Judaism. Um, they, I believe, are the best friends. The Roman Catholic Church are the best friends, religious friends of Judaism in the world. So here you have this miraculous transformation. Those who were once our biggest enemy are now our best friends, not necessarily in a political sense, because the Roman Catholic Church tries to stay out of the whole, out of the politics of the Middle East doesn't want to get caught in the crossfire between Jews and Arabs or Jews and Palestinians. It tries to stay aloof from that, but has fostered a tremendous amount of mutual understanding and mutual study between the church and Jews. Um, and then you have the mainline Protestant uh, churches, mostly in America and in Europe, is the World Council of Churches. Those are the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ. Um, they're very liberal on the political end, um, but they, uh, more often than not, unfortunately, they tend to identify with the Palestinians at the cost of really understanding and supporting the state of Israel. Um, so there are major differences theologically and politically between them, and we can talk more about that if you're interested. Now, just let me tell you where all of this ended up. Um, five years ago, I participated in a conference that was organized by the chief rabbi of Milan in Italy and the uh, Council of Italian Bishops in Italy. And there was a three-day conference in Salerno, Italy. It's a beautiful resort town. It's where the American or the Allied troops landed in Italy during World War II uh, to push back the Nazis. Um, and we spent three days there. There were five Orthodox rabbis and uh, I don't know how many Christian bishops, uh, Catholic bishops and priests and scholars. And there were 350 people at this conference who sat transfixed for two and a half days listening to these people. And when it ended, um, the, the organizers asked the participants to uh, go into a room and to assess what happened in the last two and a half days. So we, we talked about the pros and cons, what succeeded, what didn't succeed. And, before, and the rabbis all got up to leave. And the priests and the bishops said to the rabbis, rabbis, will you bless us? Will you bless us? So this was a kind of, we were stunned. We didn't know what to do with this. I mean, you know, they, these people really believe what the Torah says that the Jewish people are a kingdom of priests and the function of priests is to bless. And they thought that they believe very firmly that the Jewish people are a chosen people by God and we are responsible and we have the capacity to bless the rest of the world. 
So we gave them the, the famous blessing of peace, you know, that Kohenim given in the uh, synagogue. Uh, well, it depends where you are. Sometimes it's only on holidays. Sometimes it's only on Shabbat. Sometimes it's every morning, like in Jerusalem. But um, this was how these very religious Catholic clerics felt about the representatives of Judaism and the Jewish people. That was a really stunning moment for us. Um, so it's a whole new, I feel very blessed to be part of this um, uh, historic reconciliation. And I've learned a few things from it. Uh, one is that um, there's no substitute for human to human interaction. You know, you can read about other people, you can stereotype other people, you can even try to, you can even claim that you love other people because you read about them and you like what you read, but you really don't know anybody and you don't know their religion and you can't love anybody unless you actually engage with them, panim el panim, face to face. And the human encounter transforms uh, relationships and it, it changes minds. Uh, and it, usually for the better, usually for the better. Um, and I, what I also learned is, is, is that the truth is the opposite of what the great fear in traditional Jewish communities is. The fear is that if we expose ourselves too much to religious Christians, then we will lose our faith. And my personal experience and the experience of many people who are involved in conferences and dialogues is that on the contrary, our faiths are strengthened. Our convictions and our identities are strengthened in serious dialogue and serious engagement uh, with others. Um, so um, the, the, the Jewish Christian rivalry today I think is is uh, has largely, not completely, but largely been solved. And the real burning issue is that is really in the arena that Hanan works in today. And that's the relationship between Jews and Muslims and Jews and Arabs, Jews and Palestinians. That seems to be the real crucial issue. You have to realize that Islam never went through a reformation. They never had a second Vatican council. Um, although now they're beginning to do things like that. You heard from David Rosen, Rabbi David Rosen, last week about the changes in the Muslim world, all for the better. Um, so they're beginning to see that. But what I learned from my engagement with Christianity is that um, something miraculous took place. Um, you know, I think about my grandfather who, who came from Lithuania. <laughs> in which the church treated Jews terribly. The church was a symbol of death and, and um, uh, pogroms to people of my grandfather's generation. He never ever could have imagined that his grandson would be together with Catholic bishops in Italy and the bishops asking the rabbis for a blessing. You know, it was unimaginable. It was beyond the scope of anyone's thinking that this transformation could take place. So my feeling is that experiences taught me that uh, while Jews and Christians were at each other's throats, well, the truth is that Christians were at Jews' throats more than the reverse. For, uh, for 1,800 years, 1,700 years, and they could make peace with each other. And, and come to understand each other and appreciate with each other. If they could do that after 1800 years of hostility, then that can happen between any two people. Even between Jews and Arabs, Jews and Muslims, and Jews and Palestinians. I know it sounds almost messianic to say this, and, you, and it sounds naive to say this, but I saw it happen. You know, I was blessed to be part of that great transformation, a great revolution, that, great, that miraculous event. And, if it, and it, it gives me great hope that no matter how bad or how much hatred there is now between two people, there's always the possibility of reconciliation and mutual understanding. Um, and just as it took a trauma in the Christian world for it to change its attitude toward Jews, I think with respect to the Muslim world, um, it's going through its trauma now, with the advances in technology 
and the, the scourge of extremism. Um, and, and it's going to be forced to make changes because of historical circumstances. And I would, I would only pray that those uh, circumstances lead to greater understanding between Jews and Muslims the way it has between Jews and many, many Christian churches. Um, and let me, let me end with one picture. Um, let's go to screen sharing again. Um, okay. Here's a, here's a contemporary version of synagogue, Ecclesia in Synagogue. This is at, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in St. Joseph's University, which is, I think, a Jesuit university. There's a, they commissioned a new set of icons, Ecclesia in Synagogue. Here you have Synagogue on the left. She's a proud woman holding a Torah upright in contrast to the traditional synagogue, and she's equal in stature to Ecclesia, the church, two very proud, dignified uh, images. And that's the transformation. And here is the great hope. Um, here you have Pope Francis representing Christianity, Rabbi Abraham Skorka, representing Judaism, and an imam, whose name I don't know, but he's an imam from Buenos Aires, Argentina, embracing, hugging in front of the Kotel in Yerushalayim. That is the hope for the future. And that's, um, I think, uh, an important thing to keep in mind um, that uh, no matter how bad things are, no matter how much hatred there is, there's always the possibility, God has given us the possibility to, to reconcile with each other, to understand each other, and to build peace and understanding with each other. Okay, so that's al regal achat, as they say in Hebrew, very, very briefly, kind of my journey, uh, what's happened to many, many um, churches and, and Christian theologies today. Um, and I would love to hear from you about your experiences, your reactions, and, and your hope for the future. Thank you. Eugene, thank you very, very much. So the floor is open to anyone who'd like to ask uh, just by unmuting yourself, or if you want to in the chat to write. It's always the most difficult. The first question is always the most difficult. Let's start with the second question. Um, Rabbi Korn, I have a question for you regarding the uh, evangelical Jews, I mean evangelical Christians. Um, the, uh, the, I guess they see Jews really as uh, a means to an end. And the end is sort of the end of days and the, and that the Jews are they sort of must go through the Jews to get to that point. So shouldn't we be more suspicious and careful of uh, our relationship with them? Um, that's an excellent question. Thank you, Julian. Um, you, uh, you remember what I said before about after the Second Vatican Council, Jews are really suspicious about Catholics. You know, can we really trust these guys? Um, maybe this is a whole subter subterfuge Jews thought, and some Orthodox Jews still think it's just a, all of this dialogue stuff is just a subterfuge for them getting the, us to convert to Christianity. So, and we have the same uh, suspicions about evangelicals. It's like, uh, but the evangelicals are in a funny place. Let me put it that way. Um, Jews. Um, they have two great professions. One is being suspicious and the other is doing polling. And so Jews poll up to wazoo about everything under the sun. So when evangelicals started to um, demonstrate their great support for Israel, Jews started to ask evangelicals, why are you doing this? You know, and they, and they Pew did a study and the American Jewish Committee did a study and the ADL did a study. 
And the studies more or less were, the results of, this, of all the studies were more or less consistent with each other. The first reason, the, the majority of evangelicals um, support Israel and support um, uh, Zionism because of, not because of the aspiration that we will convert, but because they believe in the Bible in, in sometimes in literal ways. And in this 12th chapter of Genesis, when God talks to Abraham, God tells Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. So the, the, the majority reason for evangelical support, um, according to all these polls, was because um, the evangelicals believe that we are the people of God and that by supporting, by blessing Jews, they will be blessed. The second most popular reason was that they felt that Israel and the United States have common values that we share the same values. And the third was this notion that you were alluding to, Julian, that in the end of days, right, in, order, in the second coming, that the second coming will be preceded by Jews coming back to the land of Israel, right? And then when Jesus comes, and then there will be the rapture, or the different scenarios, and then Jews will convert. But that's a very distant third. Uh, the first two reasons are what we would call the Shema reasons, that is to say, they're not, they're not so invested in Jews converting, but they feel that um, by supporting Israel and supporting the Jewish people, they will benefit religiously and they will also strengthen core values. So yes, we should be cautious, um, but let's not, you know, we're, we, we, sometimes we're not happy until we find enemies. So let's not you know, the reality is bad enough. Let's not imagine enemies where, you know, the evidence doesn't indicate that, that uh, there really are enemies. But we, we can, need to continue to be cautious. I agree with you on that level. So can I ask a question? <clears throat> Hi, um, so I'm Andrew Miller. Um, I'm a believing Christian myself. Um, my background is evangelical, uh, and so that's kind of what the that's the like the stream of Christianity that I uh, grew up in. Um, I would not uh, characterize myself as that anymore, although I'm still a Christian. But um, you know, I really appreciated your summary and what you had to say, and um, you know, I I think um, I would like to acknowledge that historically anti-semitism in, in the church or among christians has been really deep and really extensive and it goes well beyond what you described um it, it's uh many many facets of it and it's awful so i want to acknowledge that and appreciate your description um i'm, I'm curious i have a couple of questions that are related if you're willing to share um i'm interested in the interactions that you had while you were at the Schwalm hartman institute with the christians there and sort of what their specific background was and along with that, I'm curious if you had much interaction with Palestinian Christians and talk to them about their theology and, and some of the other things that you mentioned. So thanks. Okay, well, that's that's like a whole nother evening, both of those topics. And uh, uh, let me I'll answer them very briefly. Um, uh, my experience at the Hartman Institute were mostly with Catholic theologians. Catholic theologian. There was one very famous Catholic theologian who was there, enormously impressive man, named Marcel Dubois. You know, Father Professor Marcel Dubois, who came at the end of his life. Well, not it was at the end of his life, uh, last decade or so of his life. He wanted to spend in Jerusalem with the Jewish people because he wanted to be with the people. He wanted to be with Jesus's people, with the people who Jesus lived with. And um, he, was, he was enormously influential, by the way, at the Second Vatican Council. He was a towering theologian who had influence on the, the thinking and the decisions um, of the Second Vatican Council. He was a very serious, um, influential theologian in the church. 
Um, he was one of the people, and there were a number of lesser figures who were like him. But what struck me was two things. Number one, their, well, three things. Number one, their, their religious sophistication. These were not Bible-thumping, you know, ignorant people. They were enormously uh, intelligent and sophisticated and nuanced. Two, um, and two, it was their love of the Jewish people, you know, that, and that's really what kind of broke the whole stereotype that I had about Esau hating Jacob, you know, I saw, I, I knew what I was taught, and then I saw with my eyes what, what the reality was. Now, they weren't all the Christians in the world, but they represented, you know, a good bit of, of uh, high teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. I, and, and there have been a number of um, Protestants who've come, but, but by and large, you know, this whole Copernican revolution um, uh, toward Judaism, you know, I think got its biggest boost from the Roman Catholic Church because they're the big elephant in the room in Christianity. Um, and, and they're hierarchical and they're organized uh, and they have a chief rabbi, you know, who they call Pope. So, so they have an authority structure that can speak um, uh, univocally. Um, so they have kind of led this, even though they didn't start this thinking, it was started by some Protestant theologians, but they're the ones who gave it the biggest boost. Um, and the other question that you asked, uh, Andrew, well, was about Palestinian Christians and your oh, actions with them. So, so uh, Hanan has taken the initiative, you know, to uh, form a what I would call a back-channel dialogue, you know, with Palestinian Christians. Um, and uh, I think it's been very fruitful, and we're very open. Uh, we have different views on what's going on, uh, you know, in our little sliver of land that has no oil, the only place in the Middle East. But, um, you know, the Palestinian Christians, uh, some of them come from violent backgrounds, and they've realized that violence doesn't work. And uh, now they become peaceniks. Now, not all of them, not even the majority of them. Um, uh, the Palestinian Christians are between a rock and, a, in my judgment, they're between a rock and a hard place because they, uh, they're not flourishing under the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority has become more and more uh, Islamic or has become more and more religious over time. Um, and that puts the Palestinian Christians in a, in a difficult spot. On the other hand, you know, they, they see their future with the Palestinian people, not with the Israeli, not with the Israelis. Um, and it's very dangerous for them uh, to speak out against Palestinian authorities. The truth is, it's very dangerous for Palestinian Muslims to speak out against the authorities. So they have to be very careful in what they say and do. Um, they're really in, in a, between a rock and a hard place there. But there are good people amongst them, and they, they want to see peace also. The question is, can the, the question for all of us is, can the good people who want peace and understanding and pragmatism and just a, a decent life for our children, you know, can we overcome the political forces of radicalism and hatred and absolutism? That's what's going on here um, amongst the Palestinian Christians and also amongst the Palestinian Muslims. But the Christians, you know, they're a minority of a minority. So they remind me of the situation that my grandfather was in in Tsarist Russia. You know, he, 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 Jews just weren't free to oppose the authorities because they, they were enormously vulnerable. Please. There's a lot to say in that, but... Everyone is welcome to speak. I can ask a question. Um, I'm wondering if in the, lo the local leadership in the various Catholic churches, they're actively trying to teach about Jews and combat anti-Semitism, just looking at the rise of anti-Semitism all over the world. Yes, well, I think um, the, the, the global answer is yes, they are. <clears throat> I mean, this... Um, one of the most absolute statements condemning anti-Semitism that I've ever seen from anybody is really written into the text of this document, Nostra Aetate. It says that um, 
uh, anti-Semitism is, uh, is deplorable for in any place at any time for any reason. You know, you can't get much more categorical than that. Now, um, and by the way, Pope John Paul II um, said many, many times that anti-Semitism is a crime against human beings and a sin against God. You know, you can't get much, you know, more uh, um, serious about the sinfulness of, about the crime of anti-Semitism than to, than to say that. And that came from the Pope many, many times. And it's been repeated by Benedict and now uh, Pope Francis. So uh, now, and, and by the way, just to, as an example, one of the outcomes of this uh, Nostra Aetate and the Second Vatican Council teachings is that Catholic universities set up uh, centers and departments for Catholics and Jews to study to go, uh, for Catholics to study Judaism and to have Jewish professors on Catholic campuses teaching about Judaism. So again, you know, it's one thing to make high pronouncements. It's another thing to have the actual human to human engagement and learning to, and growing together as people. Now, I will say that there are still pockets of anti-Semitism in the church, uh, some of them in Eastern Europe, some of them in, in Poland, let's say, but um, they've been completely overwhelmed by the, the official Vatican normative teachings of that Jesus. And, and I really meant what I said before, um, uh, that the Roman Catholic Church today is, I think, the best religious friend of the Jewish people, um, bar none, in the world. Okay. You know, I'll, I'll just give you one little anecdote. Um, sometimes when I go to an Orthodox synagogue and people know that I'm involved in Jewish Catholic or Jewish Christian relations, they say, what are, you, what are you wasting your time on this for? You know, why do you want to deal with these people? Um, so I say to them, well, you know, you're an Orthodox Jew, right? They say, yes. Do you believe in uh, Torah min Shemayim? Do you believe that the Torah was divinely revealed? Yes. Do you believe that the Jews are chosen people? Yes. Do you believe that the scripture makes a claim on you? That is, it's not just a cultural expression, you know, but when the Torah says, thou shalt not, you know, that makes a claim on you. It's not just a statement by somebody in the past. And they say, yes, of course I believe that. So I say, when you go outside the shul, when you go outside the synagogue, who can you talk to who also believes that? And the answer is pious Christians. Pious Christians, you know? And that's why the theological dialogue has been so fruitful between religious Jews and religious Christians, um, because they have a certain common set of assumptions. There's another example. You know, you can't deal, I deal a lot in Jewish ethics. So the starting point of all Jewish ethics is that every human being is sacred. Every human being is created in the image of God. The only other people in the world who talk that way is the Roman Catholic Church. So when we talk ethics, we have the same starting axioms. You can't talk to a secularist about human beings being created in the image of God. You know, it's a different world. It's a different world. So yes, I think, I think that this message is filtering down. It may uh, be filtering down too slowly, but as David Rosen, as Robert Rosen said last week, institutions like the church, like Islam, like Orthodox Judaism or, or traditional Judaism, you know, are very conservative with the small c um, uh, institutions and the change comes slowly. But it's certainly there. Rabbi? Rabbi Korn? Yes. Uh, I appreciate your commentary, uh, obviously related to your personal experiences. And I am inclined to, uh, even though I don't, sh I don't share your life, I am inclined to appreciate also that in the religious environment and the more educated environment, you're more inclined to have this greater acceptance, greater knowledge, greater desire to learn more about each other. However, the however is the big part. How do you explain the rise in anti-Semitism 
that is so prolific now, whether it's this country, whether it's uh, any European country, whether it's, uh, it's, it's just all over. It's frightening. It actually frightens me because in my childhood, I knew anti-Semitism on a scale that was paramount. It existed in every facet of my being. Um, and and I, I, I can live with fear if I just allow it to, if I allow my brain to uh, overtake my, my being, it's very frightening to me. Yes. I, yeah, I, I mean, I share that concern, Gilda. It is very, very worrisome. And it's become a very widespread phenomenon. Um, but, uh, and, and I think we need to understand where it's coming from. Right? Where's the anti-Semitism coming from? In my judgment, um, the anti-Semitism is coming from the extreme right and from the extreme left. It is unlike the past, it is not coming from the churches. It's coming from extreme secularists, you know, progressive wokes, one could, you know, that's the this, some of this terminology. Universalists who deny the legitimacy of Jewish particularism or of Zionism. And uh, that often morphs into, into anti-Semitism. And it's coming from white supremacists and uh, people on the extreme right. Now, why it's surfaced and is is uh, mat metastasizing so much today, you know, I I have some theories, but this isn't really not my area. But it is. But the the fact the causes we can discuss, but the effects are are there for everybody to see. Um, so in this regard. I would say that um, this is yet another reason, this is a political reason, one could say, or an existential reason for Jews and Christians to cooperate with, the, with, uh, with each other even more because Christians can and should be and are our allies in this. I mean, if, I mean, look in the Middle East, look in the Middle East, the same forces uh, are, thank God, you know, Jews in the Middle East have an army to protect uh, ourselves, you know, but you know who the new Jews of the Middle East are? The Christians of the Middle East. They're getting destroyed, uh, either exterminated or driven out or persecuted right, by the extremists in the Middle East. Um, so we have common enemies in that regard. So we should, and the, when the Pope says that anti-Semitism is a sin against God, that's a tremendous um, uh, asset to the Jewish fight against anti-Semitism. It's all the more reason why we need to cooperate with believing Christians who now understand that anti-Semitism is a sin. So yes, there was anti-Semitism in the past in the West, and now there's anti-Semitism again, but it's coming from different sources. So what do we do about it? You know, it, I don't know. We just need to teach Fight the good fight and, and teach, you know, the, about the sanctity of every individual and uh, the legitimacy of uh, the Jewish people and and Jewish particularity. And stand up for ourselves. And the poison of hate. Rabbi Korn. Uh, Rabbi Korn. Yes, Richard. Um, yeah, Rabbi Korn. Um, I wanted to uh, share with you something that happened in my life um, in the year 2000. Um, I attended um, a, a session uh, in the uh, outskirts of Buffalo uh, between uh, the Jewish community and Catholic community um, that uh, heard a professor of religion at Boston University um, by the name of Adam B. Seligman. And uh, a week or so later, I was at an educators conference in Jerusalem where I heard something very similar from Violet Bishara Mitri Al-Raheb, a Palestinian Lutheran teacher. 
and it had to do with the idea of religious tolerance. Um, I wrote something some years ago that, rem that put together the thoughts of these teachers. Um, and it said the following. Uh, so these are, these are my words based on my remembrances. The American view of religious tolerance is based on the separation of church and state taught by Roger Williams, a 17th century Puritan minister. The separation of religious and secular aspects of our lives and our society is very hard to maintain in the modern world in which ideas and ideals from many cultures around the globe are being brought together in business, education, and communications. A better model for tolerance of the ideas, faiths, and beliefs of others comes from an understanding that none of us knows or is able to know the whole truth about anything. Even the prophet Moses, who was said to be as close to God as any human being could get, was not able to see directly God's presence, to understand with complete certainty God's ways. Therefore, how can any of us know with complete certainty what or who God is or what God demands from us? Tolerance means that we allow space in our own understanding for the truths held by others. Amen. I, I think that's true. Um, that's, you know, that's a, a, a true spiritual position. I mean, anybody who's a true believer in the one creator of heaven and earth understands that we, no one person can understand the God and no one person or no one religion has has a monopoly on truth. Uh, and therefore we need to listen to others. You know, that was, you know, that's what Abraham Heschel said, uh, referenced before, no religion is an island. Right? No religion is a universe uh, that, that, that contains all truth. That's true. And that's, by the way, you know, that's, you can find antecedents to that in the Bible, but I would say his, as a historical awareness, as a historical awareness, that's a relatively modern spiritual appreciation, right? The, problem in the past is that when religion um, has gotten power, you know, it, the, the message is that error has no rights. We have the truth. And if you're in error, you have no rights. Um, so one of the great tests of religion now is uh, what happens when religion do we become tolerant or do we become dictatorial and intolerant? Uh, Rabbi Korn, I, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I'm trying to put words to a feeling and that's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, uh, my own commitment to um, uh, I mean this sounds arrogant, but my own commitment to uh, embracing the Jewish foundations of uh, my own Christian faith uh, is um, for me without uh, without question. Um, there's a sense in which, for me, it is one continuous history uh, with various parts, uh, not a supersessionism or any kind of thing, but a, a statement that uh, I cannot understand my own traditions without beginning at the beginning, and that beginning is not just Jesus, but uh, Jesus himself was uh, a Jew and uh, fully within that community, and therefore I, I need to take that seriously. But I am also, um, I suppose you can say under the weight of what was, uh, well, in fact, what the previous Richard said, which is larger than all of this is the, uh, the mystery of God and the sense in which um, 
those of us who have been fighting um, among religious traditions or among political uh, events and all are all under the judgment of God. Fortunately, uh, a God that also has been displayed to be very, to be loving and forgiving and merciful. So maybe what I'm being is defensive about coming from a, a, a somewhat left-wing Protestant tradition, the, the United Church of Christ, which um, has gone on record um, at one point um, to be part of the BDS movement uh, and uh, can so might sound sometimes almost more, almost as if it were making its relationship to Palestinians more significant than its relationship to Israelis. And I would say Israelis, they would not say the relationship to Jews and Judaism is, is uh, without question. But it's rather the, this thorn that sticks in all our sides of uh, resolving relationships with the Palestinians. Um, Christian Palestinians, Muslim Palestinians, uh, it's one of the reasons I keep coming into these uh, conversations is because of my profound respect for Roots and for what it is doing to uh, deepen and perpetuate and sustain a conversation that I feel is absolutely necessary and does not try to put one over the other. You know, these are Jews being generous or Palestinians being humble or, or anything like that, but engaging with each other in the full strength of our own identity. So, um, um, again, as a humble member of a local United Church of Christ here in the backwoods of Maine, um, I, um, I appreciate the profound difference that was made in a, in, in a public way by the, by the uh, Catholic statements that came out of uh, the Second Vatican Council. Um, But my experience, my experience is um, of, I suppose one could say a more humble and just ongoing continuous understanding that uh, Jews and Christians always have been uh, and continue to be brothers and sisters and uh, part of the same family and like some families, we've fought like hell, but um, that, 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 I guess that's, that for me is, is sort of the foundation. And that that family also then needs to understand and deal with uh, others who will become someday, I, support, I suppose, a kind of part of it. And that would be those mis Muslims uh, who are willing to talk and to relate and to understand that we are all, all children of God. Amen. I, I agree. And I think, you know, that, that um, the, the conflict and the disagreement with the Palestinians needs to be settled, not only on a political level, but spiritually it needs to be settled. No religious person can say, well, there are these five million people there, but we don't have to consider their interests. They're also created in the image of God. And they also deserve dignity and they deserve uh, a fair chance to have a, li a life that flourishes. So that's a profound spiritual orientation. Um, how we do that is difficult, um, but I'll tell you, it'll never happen with the policy of uh, uh, refusal of contact or anti-normalization 
or denial of the legitimacy of the other party. There has to be first a recognition that we all have rights, we're all children of God, we all deserve uh, dignity and to be heard. And um, that's that starting point, I think the sides have not yet, at least the political leaders of both sides have not yet arrived at. Perhaps I'll ask a question. Way, I would say that, that this is where I think religious leaders can play a very significant role um, in, in that regard. You know, I, that, that uh, the Islamic tradition and the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition all affirm that human beings uh, are transcendent and they have, they have rights to dignity, you know. And therefore, I think one of the reasons, and I think Rabbi Rosen may have said this last week, you know, one of the reasons that so a lot of these peace efforts have failed is because it's ignored, you know, the religious, the significant religious value system and uh, uh, leadership, you know, of, of these different cultures. And therefore it's very significant, by the way, that it was called the, that the recent peace accords between Israel and, and the United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain were called the Abraham Accords, you know, because there's a certain common appreciation of our common roots and of, our, and of what we can agree on religiously. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, Eugene, you talked about the importance of human to human contact for changing stereotypes. You talked about it in your own experience. I'm concerned about the image of the Christian in the mind of Israeli religious Jews. And the problem is there's not enough Christians to go around in Israel. In other words, uh, how are we going to uh, continue this forward momentum of changing the Jewish perception of Christians when Israelis don't have an opportunity to meet any Christians? What are we gonna do? Yes, I mean, that's one of the significant differences between the Jewish community in Israel and the Jewish community in America, right? In America, unless you live in some ghetto, some self-imposed ghetto, you know, Christian uh, Jews interact with Christians all the time you know, at work, in the neighborhood, in municipal councils, you know, whatever. Sometimes they, they marry, you know. Um, so, but in Israel, that's not the case. And, and the, I think the more you go along the religious uh, spectrum, you know, the, the more religious you get, the less interaction there is, and the less exposure there is. Uh, and I think that's a tragedy. I really do. I think most religious Israelis, maybe most Israelis in general, are basically clueless about contemporary Christian teachings about Jews and Judaism. Um, uh, and uh, it's up to teachers to kind of open up this whole new world to religious Jews. Um, I mean, the, sometimes my most rewarding work is... Um, working with religious Jews and trying to show them uh, how much religious Jews and religious Christians have in common. But um, there's a lot of work to be done there. Again, so how we do it, I don't know. Uh, we do it through a center that I helped found on the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation in Jerusalem. You know, you do it by, uh, sometimes it's done by grand gestures when the Pope comes to Israel or when significant uh, uh, Protestant leaders come to Israel, um, I think uh, Jews cannot afford to you know, have their head in the sand about this. Um, there is this kind of bunker ghetto mentality of just, you know, stay within your own community. But that's, but, you know, I think, again, Abraham Heschel said it correctly. He says, the choice is between um, interreligious activity uh, what is it? In, 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 interfaith or internealism, you know, in the modern world, if unless you recognize the other person, you have to you basically are, are letting the world uh, be bereft of values. Um, so, if you want to participate in the modern world, you, you need to you need to do this, and it's all for the better, I believe. So specific, I, I don't have any specific suggestions for you. 
uh, Hanan, except, I mean, I teach in Orthodox synagogues and communities about this, and it's like, um, it's like a revelation from Sinai, you know, they've never heard this before because they're, they're so insulated, and that's a tragedy. In a certain sense, that's uh, the tragedy of the success of Zionism. Uh, that Zionism has separated Jews from the world uh, successfully, yes. but it has yes. a downside to it. Yes, and I would also say, by the way, that it's a great tragedy from the point of view of Judaism. You know, it's a tragedy from the point of view of the, of the Torah. It's yes. a tragedy from the point of view of the Brit. The Torah says no less than five times that that Jews that through Abraham and his descendants the entire world shall be blessed. So our mission, the Jewish mission, is to somehow interact with the outside world, to bring blessings to the outside world through ethics and belief in God. You know? So when you're in a ghetto and you don't want to deal with the outside world, you're turning your back on the fundamental spiritual mission of the Jewish people. Now, Jews have done this uh, because this, of historical reasons. We've been traumatized by persecution on the outside. But one of the great opportunities in Israel is we are now strong. We're now, now a minority. We shouldn't be afraid to be out there and to be players on the world scene and to interact with the nations. That's what God wants of us. So that's perhaps a good way to end. Uh, so I will say thank you to all our participants. And of course, thank you to our speaker, Rabbi Dr. Eugene Korn. I think we learned an awful lot tonight, or today. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back next week uh, at the same time in America, but a different time in Israel. If we'll be back to 9.30 at night at Israel and the Eastern Seaboard as always, 2.30 in the afternoon. And our speaker next week is Rabbi Dr. Yaakov Nagin, who's gonna be speaking again about interfaith connections. His topic is why religion has to be part of the solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And so, I, would, I would like to you know, thank Hanan again, and in particular, the work that he does with Roots. You know, you're really uh, not making peace, but building peace, building peace, getting people ready you know, to accept the possibility and the desirability of peace. And uh, that's the only way it happens. So thank you very much, Hanan. You're welcome. I mean, good day and good night, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. God Bye. God bless.